the problem here is that when it comes to people we care about, it's very difficult to navigate a conversation, especially when there's already distrust there. And when I use the word distrust, I want to be clear that the distrust is not limited to a particular church, but churches in general. And that's why I said it is noteworthy that every single denomination, every branch of Christianity, in fact, I'd say every branch of any kind of religion where a man or mankind is involved, you'll find corruption because that is in our nature. That's the way it goes. Don't look for something that's perfect, but do establish what the church is for and why it exists. <laughs>
find that from the very beginning, right after the time of Christ, right after his death, resurrection, and ascension, within a short period of time, corruption came in. You then, once you start reading the history, you can go back in this book and see why people like the Apostle Paul were warning the Corinthians and the Galatians and everything, do not depart from the gospel and the doctrine which you received. For many people came in trying to pervert the gospel, but there isn't another gospel. There's only one good news gospel. The idea here is to, in my introduction, to present some very simple things, and then we're going to get into a little bit of history briefly. And this may not be the type of message where you leave here um, so filled with all kinds of fluffy feelings that you just feel like a cotton ball, but rather this is the type of message that you could actually hand to somebody and maybe the first of a few that says, please take a listen to this with an open mind because my, again, I will repeat, my design is not to proselytize you and to get you somehow, me, to get you to convert to Christianity. Only God can do that. Only God is able to open up our hearts and our minds. Mine was closed for many years, even though I said I knew God. And the fact of the matter is when I began to listen to Dr. Scott and the teaching, I realized I did not know God. I knew a God of my own imagination, a God by my understanding, because we all have this idea that God can be whatever we want him to be. And by the way, he is a him, not a she. <laughs> Just making sure we're all on the same page. But the problem here is that when it comes to people we care about, it's very difficult to navigate a conversation, especially when there's already distrust there. And when I use the word distrust, I want to be clear that the distrust is not limited to a particular church, but churches in general. And that's why I said it is noteworthy that every single denomination, every branch of Christianity, in fact, I'd say every branch of any kind of religion where man or mankind is involved, you'll find corruption because that is in our nature. That's the way it goes. Don't look for something that's perfect, but do establish what the church is for and why it exists. And the first thing is Christ, when he said, I'll build my church, he was talking about building a people that belong to him, outcalled ones that belong to the Lord. So when people talk about the church, it's very disturbing if the understanding is you are part of the church as his people, not as a building, not as an institution, not as a body that writes canon law that dictates what you can and cannot do. The whole goal of a church, any church, is to bring the gospel, but the whole book to life, to explain, to come, to exposit, to pull apart and pull open and make plain the very simple things that even in today's society, people are still arguing about. For example, and the topic will never end, well, there'll still be debates about whether people believe in evolution or whether, again, if you're gonna go down that pathway and I can sit down with anybody who has a different opinion and I'll listen to you, I wanna be heard as well, but give me Give me some hardcore proof. Don't just say, I feel like or I think. Back it up so that when we begin to really argue the matter of what it is you're presenting to me, uh, I will indeed try to pierce holes in it to try and look at the validity of it. But above all, I'm going to go back to this book. This is my, my compass. But if you take people who are hung up on evolution, we must have evolved and the theory which has been presented uh, and presented over and over again versus those of us who believe that God spoke and out of nothing, everything. And I find it fascinating, I've made reference to this, that the scientists, those people who are looking into space that are talking about this still expanding dark uh, matter, if you will, I believe is still the effects of God speaking whenever he first spoke that is still continuing to expand. 
what these will not acknowledge as God. But the curiosity for me is how to say you're just an accident. And I've used the example of a watch, of taking a watch and saying, if you took apart a watch and tossed it up in the air, would it land back on your wrist and all in one piece and working? You could say, well, it just happened that way. And this is how we came into being. But it would require some definite precision. If you think about how we are made, how our bodies are made, how we are designed. And it's not as though we have radically changed from the beginning of recorded human history. There is a birth time and there is a death time. And nothing has changed. We can say that we have figured out how to live better, how to eat better, how to fix certain things, but there's still this beginning and end. That has not changed. I cannot call that evolution. I have to say that God had a design at the beginning which starts in the book of Genesis. And that design was for God to, as he did, make Adam in his own image, and I believe was for his good pleasure, for Adam and God to be together in perfect communion. So when people say, well, well why do I need the church? Why do I need to come to church? Why should I even bother listening? Because I don't want to know about the church, and I don't want to know about the Bible, because you can't believe the, the reliability of this. Who knows where this came from? My argument begins with this, and it will always be the same thing. It's rhetorical, so don't answer. But do you think that you were just made so that time can, like that um, time piece that the sand goes through, that somehow you're just made so that the time, the sand can just erode, and when it expires, you do, and that's it? Because if that's all it is, then all we're doing is passing time, and the best we do is possibly improve our lives based on some false hope that there is something beyond the here and now. That's all. Or you come to a knowledge of something, which is in this book, which tells you God's design. And it is indeed why I said to you, my, my heart is with these two individuals. And I know that these two individuals represent hundreds, if not thousands, of people that I may or may not know who are in the same place. They have no faith. They're disconnected from the church. And as I said, only God can do that. But I'm thinking, I'm at least going to put this out as a way to say this is a place to begin. Because if you think about it, what is appointed to man, a set time to live, and I'm using man generically, so don't say sexist. It's generic, humankind, man. There is an appointed time. The oldest human being on record, I think we just saw, is 116. I think that was what I saw, 116, she might be 119, I don't know. A little Asian lady. She looked pretty good for her age, by the way. Very happy, and she was eating cake. <laughs> but that's an anomaly. And by and large, when you look at it, you know, most people, and they might get into their 80s and 90s, and, and that's their allotted time. Who knows? Only God knows. But there is an allotted time. And the question is, why not? You know where I'm going, so why not open your heart, or at least your eyes and your ears, to a little bit of information that says possibly what's been closed off for all these years could be opened up because I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm not really trying, although I'm presenting, I'm not really trying to tell you that you shouldn't distrust. In fact, I'm gonna, I'm gonna prove to you today why you should distrust. That's radical coming from the mouth of a person like me. Why you should distrust. Why you should have reservations about just openly listening to anybody. There are a plethora of experts on the internet who know all about the Bible. Okay? And they will tell you how you should read the Bible. You should read it backwards, forwards. You should start with this book. There are experts that will tell you you know, if you really want to get saved, you got to read these passages here, and then you got to say the sinner's prayer. There's, there are experts everywhere. And this is probably what separates some people in the pastorate from a sea of voices. If you have a burden for people, 
and I do, who have not heard the gospel, they are turned off and have confused God and the church by some corrupted method that they've been exposed to as a negative bad thing to avoid. And especially these who are approaching, we'll call it, the last few miles of their life. How tragic to live a life without faith and never knowing who the risen Christ is and the hope of glory. Let me tell you, when I didn't listen to Dr. Scott, I used to say, oh, of course I believe in heaven, but mine was the heaven of my imagination. It was the heaven that somehow in caricature is the thing we probably all imagine as children, you know, little cherubim babies kind of in diapers with harps and shooting arrows and all that kind of crazy stuff and clouds and whatever else is going on in heaven. And then I read one day, and it was very moving to me, I read one day about Christ's promise for just one thing, for my faith in him to receive life eternal. And what, what should that mean? Life eternal essentially at the moment I begin to faith starts in the here and now. And I begin to learn about the one who I'm going to spend eternity with. Eternity is beyond your years allotted here. It is forever and ever and ever. Now, if you still wish to be on the side of saying you still don't believe, I can respect that once you've spent the time at least to listen. And as I've said in doing my studies, particularly for my degree, I had to expose myself to certain things that maybe I did not want to do, but had to do in order to have a certain knowledge and not be acting in ignorance, specifically when it comes to the fields that I am discussing. Same thing is true when people start talking about religion. My late husband used to say, everybody's born an expert on what? Religion and politics. There you go. So unfortunately, that's the way things happen. But at the core of my faith and at the core of the church, and I'm now using the church in a global way. I'm not just saying this church. I'm saying the church. Is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he lived, he came in the flesh, the incarnation, and he foretold of the necessity of him laying down his life for a human, we'll call it since the time of Adam, since the fall, covered in sin without any possibility of removing the stain of that sin and the reconciliation of that perfect communion that existed before the fall, where he foretold of his death and his resurrection. They didn't understand when he said that the temple would be torn down and be raised up. Or when he said, there'll be no other sign, they came to him, to Jesus, and said, give us a sign. He said, there'll be no other sign except the sign of Jonah, which was what? Three days and three nights in the big fish's mouth, belly, wherever other parts he ended up, who knows. So, and by the way, for those people who are still not sure, it's okay sometimes to, to uh, lighten up a little bit. I don't think God's going to be offended if we should have a little laugh. I don't think God is sitting up there and saying, be uptight, be real uptight. <laughs> Unfortunately, when we begin to navigate church history, you begin to see that people start to think that it's the sacraments in the church that save them. Now, I'm leaning heavily towards using the language that most Catholics and maybe some Anglicans might kind of go, yeah, I know what that is. But the sacraments that save, the sacraments that you must do or you must qualify to participate in, and the rituals that are dictated by canon law. Those are those things that if you go back into the records of Catholicism, things that were implemented by humankind. And it seems like, well, why wouldn't somebody protest to these things? Well, they did, and that's how Protestants and the Protestant Reformation came about. Because somebody who could actually read the actual writings recognized that many of these things being peddled as official church doctrine were not even in the Bible. They were doctrines of men to make money and merchandise out of simple people who couldn't read and didn't have a Bible for themselves. 
So it seems like a lot of what, when we reach into history, we uncover a lot, and that's why I said it's good, it's good to distrust, because in distrusting, you're not approaching something and saying, oh, I'm just, I'm just a, a dummy with blinders on, and I'll follow anybody that says Jesus, Lord, and church, because they say it. Told you about one particular evangelist, you know, let's talk about the skyscraper stories, and every now and then you throw in a hallelujah, Jesus, and an amen, and that's spiritual for some people. But the problem is that most people treat the church like a brand, their favorite brand. You have a favorite brand of coffee, of clothing, and that's the only brand. That's what they know. That's their form of. And I'm not dissing that. Now, some people are, are not interested in learning. They want to go into a ceremony. They want to be stirred up emotionally. And I, I know all about this from going into the churches in my past, and be taken up with the regalia. But I've told you, I've got many friends who are actually in the Catholic Church, and the discussion is always, what did you learn? Did you learn anything? What was said? And if anything is said, it's kind of in these encapsulated statements, much like a Sunday school lesson for children. I'm not going to say that that's bad, but if you spend your entire life on Sunday school stories, never coming to what is called the meat and something that's a little harder to chew on, that's a little bit, makes you a little bit uneasy. That is where growth comes. Growth does not come by taking in pablum your whole life. And certainly, when we talk about knowing God, there's only one way to know God. How do you get to know a person? You spend time with them. How do you get to know God? Spend time in his book. And if the book is complicated, I've said this before, Start with something very simple. Find a version, an English version, or whatever your native language is, in an easy to read form. It may not be the best form, but find, except for the Message Bible. <laughs> but find yourself something where it's an easy read and start reading it. And once you've got the gist of each book, move yourself up a notch to a little bit more challenging, and we'll call it maybe a little bit more academic translation that might be slightly more accurate. I have been using the King James, Dr. Scott used the King James, and the King James, as we know, was written at a time that was, first of all, you're talking about a shift in the English language, which has just occurred, and a lot of what we'll call, it, it is Old English, which appears in this book, and a lot of things that are sexist. And if you go back to the Greek, specifically in the New Testament, if you go back to the Greek, they are neither male nor female. They are neutral in gender. It was the time in which this book was translated into its form, this version, the King James Version. And at that time, society was a very male-dominated, male-controlled, and those who were doing the translation had no problem to say when referring to let no man or any, it was in the Greek very clear in some cases it is masculine, but in many cases it may be neutral, which has led many people down the road to wrong paths and wrong interpretations. And some down the road feel as though they've been left out because they read a translation and they say, well, this, is not, this doesn't even include me. God has included everyone. The thing that he has made sure of is that this book has survived even in our very young English language. If you compare English to Greek, which is much more, Greek is much more precise and much older. And our language, of course, is much younger and not as precise. So we've got a lot of issues when it comes to translation. And probably if I'm going to sum all this introduction up, as I mentioned, how people view the church and their understanding, there should be something that you walk away with. It may not be every single Sunday, but let's just take a bird's eye view of a year's time. And actually, I'm going to remove myself from the church and say, let's just say you enrolled yourself in something. 
you, were, you went to learn something, a language, a vocation, a skill. At the end of a year, you should be able to look back and say, I have learned something. I'm walking away with more knowledge than when I started. Is this true? I hope so. Amen. Good. We're on the same page then. Well, it's true then of the church as well. Now, there, there's, there are no new truths. There's 66 books, and you keep kind of finding, we'll call them the hard points, and you keep revisiting them in a diversity of ways. And as you become more familiar, this is the way God's book is, as you become more familiar having gotten the big picture by the easy reading and move yourself up gradually, you come to realize that you don't actually know all that you think you know. And the more you stay in the book and the more you listen, the more you realize that these things are very deep. And although the surface is very simple, in the beginning God created very simple statements, and yet how profound and how humankind has been polarized over these very simple but so profound that the human mind can, cannot even begin to actually understand the mind of God in God's ways until you actually are in this book for a time and you realize this is far, be even though I understand, it's far beyond me. Why? Because it's God speaking through the, the mouth or the pen of a man to write down these things inspired by God's spirit. So when people talk about, let me just take a little sidebar. I don't want to do it today, but I am, I will do this. So just bear with me. But some people talk about the reliability of this book, and specifically the reliability of the New Testament. Here's what I have to say to those people. There are over 5,000 fragments and manuscripts combined, which if you look at the witness to literature in antiquity. This is the most literature, 5,000 fragments to complete manuscripts in total that we have as an example. Over and beyond Roman literature, over and beyond Greek literature, over and beyond Jewish literature. And yet we still have people saying, well, should I trust this? Is this real? Including the fragment that is considered, and I'm, I'm not quite sure that it is still considered the oldest, but the Oxyrhynchus, the John 18 fragment, which they move the date because no one can actually pinpoint it. It's a very small fragment to work with, but it was at one point dated, and I think they may have changed it, but it was at one point dated to 125 AD. If, even if it is remotely close to that date, it puts that little fragment of John 18 within essentially 26 to 30 years of John's death. Quite remarkable, I'd say, if you're going to start to argue about authenticity. So I, don't, I, I, I want to tackle that, but not today, because there'll be people who say, well, I, I'd like to listen to you, but I don't even know if this is real or not. Well, that's not my message today, but I'm saying to you, I can go at this from a diversity of ways, I don't want to talk about the reliability today because I've already crossed that hurdle for myself in my studies. As I said, I'm tempted to present it. But to show you why I'm using the word you should distrust is when you start digging into history, specifically church history, you find some important things that have been chronicled for us that have been passed down. and. One of these has to do with the date that's coming up, Easter. Now, I think apart from the bulk of the churches, except for the Orthodox Church, which usually separates its, it celebrates its celebrations at a different time, but most people will celebrate Easter in a few weeks from now. And Easter is a real celebration, but let's start there. I want to peel this back to show people how, and the information is, is out there for you to discover. When people talk about Easter celebrations and the common caricature that you find, hey, listen, I love chocolate. I'm not allowed to have it, but I love chocolate. I don't really like chocolate eggs. 
And I don't want to be eating chocolate bunnies either. I just like to look at them. But these are all caricatures. They're wonderful for kids, and we get kids to get excited, and the Easter egg hunt and all that. But all of this is a caricature, most of it stemming from pagan celebrations and festivities. And when you start peeling back the layers, you find something really remarkable. I remember when I first started this search, and this has to be years and years ago, I was interested to know what happened between the Easter, we'll call it the Easter celebration, which is really not an Easter celebration, but the Easter celebration that is chronicled in the Gospels for us, which is actually the Passover. Even Paul says Christ our Passover. What happened between that celebration and the Easter that we have today is an amazing thread of, if you want drama, look no further. See, by the time of the death of John, we're talking about John who wrote the Gospel of John, who is the last surviving of the eyewitnesses of those that were in Christ's immediate circle. And most people put his death somewhere in the late 90s and maybe as late as 100, but certainly 90 in the late 90s. And then you've got an interesting situation that begins to happen. As the Great Commission, by the way, was being carried out by the disciples. When Christ said, go ye into all the nations, right? And he tells them to go out and teach the people. He didn't say, show them how to feel good or entertain them. He said, teach them, make disciples, make learners out of them, which is what the church should be doing still to this day. But you only have to go until about the year one, well, I'm going to say maybe 116, 117. I may be off by one year. In the Chronicles of the Catholic Church. Now, when I use the word Catholic, it is not yet in history. It has not yet become a split, quite split church. Although the formation of such an institution began to morph itself as if you remember in the book of Acts, people were coming and being saved, and it was a multitudinous lot being saved that were coming in, and the church was rapidly expanding. Now, it's one thing when you've got one leader, rabbi, master, Lord Jesus, with his 12, and the ladies that supported and followed him, versus now a whole community, which could be quite unruly, some of them coming out of Judaism, some of them coming out of paganism. So... Now we've got this kind of the need to do what we'll call crowd control. It's not enough to just say we're doing this. Now we've got to start implementing rules to kind of keep everybody in their box, which those rules primarily came from the established church at Rome. Here's what happens. In one somewhere between 166 and 174, and the dates, if you look them up, they are all over the map, but in that general ballpark, then we'll say circa those dates, a pope by the name of Soter, S-O-T-E-R, whose name would mean savior in English, he establishes in his time as pope, he inaugurates the celebration at Rome of Easter. Don't think that it originated there, but he, he basically inaugurates the celebration at Rome. See, most people think that as you follow church history, by the time these councils of people gather under Constantine, the Council of Nicaea that gathered in 325 AD, most people think that's when the date of Easter was settled, and they just kind of put a period there. No, that's when they established that we're going to eradicate any other idea or celebration because this implementation of what we now call it dogma of what we now celebrate was not unanimous. We're not talking about whether or not Christ rose. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a day, a date, and a year. This problem became a huge problem for 
we'll call it the beginning of a great bifurcation of believers, which eventually morphed the Roman Church into the Holy Roman Catholic Church. And Catholic at that time before meant universal. Later, it will simply, it will fraction itself versus those who were believers, Christians of Asia Minor who were not necessarily under the same control of the Roman Church. Now, what happens here, that's why I said you should distrust, don't think that I've gone off on a sidebar. This all has to do with why people need to look at information, why it matters. It's very clear if you read Catholic history, and they've chronicled it enough, that you'll find that from approximately the time, if you go behind the time that Soter establishes, Pope Soter establishes the inauguration of the festival of Easter at Rome, it is pretty safe to say that between the years 116, 117, through to his establishing that time, so let's call it 50 years, just to be on the safe side, somewhere in that ballpark. We don't even know that there was even an Easter celebration of any kind. Now, don't get confused. I'm not saying Easter is a real, real deal. The, the name Easter is, is English, doesn't even properly represent what we're talking about, but I'm using this until I get to that part, so bear with me. But it's very clear that there was a lot of confusion and at least a 50-year period within the Catholic recorded record that reflects no celebration or mass confusion. Now, you go from, you're saying, did I come to church to learn about Catholic history? Yeah, it's important. It's really important. You pass from Soter and his successor. I remember his name because if you think about it, I always say his, his name is Uterus, and then you put Ellie in front of it, Ellie Uterus. <laughs> I have weird ways to remember things. After him, yes, yeah, so the Pope, Pope Uterus. So, <laughs> I'll leave that one alone. The Pope after him is Pope Victor. And this is what starts to get really where you start to see how we tend to not analyze this history at all. He dispatches from his see or wherever he, he's at Rome, he dispatches a bunch of bishops throughout the Mediterranean to discuss the subject of Easter celebrations. Why? Because the Christians in Asia Minor, for the most part, we're celebrating Easter in conjunction with the date of the Passover. That would be, you find that date in Exodus when God institutes the Passover and gives the instructions to Moses before they exit out of the land of Egypt. And those instructions given are given for the 14th day of Nisan, which is on our calendar, March, April, the 14th day. So we have people in Asia Minor who are celebrating, and this is why I said it's, the, it's these small details. They're celebrating the Passover. They're calling it Pascha but they're not celebrating the Passover as instituted by Moses. They're celebrating the Passover, Christ, our Passover, on that day, recognizing the fulfillment of the set times of God. They would not abandon that time to go with the church at Rome that said, no, it must be on a Sunday, and here's how we reckon the time. Now remember, you could never make these two worlds meet because the Jewish calendar functioned on the lunar and the Roman calendar was on the solar. You could never make these two worlds meet, and yet it was like, hey, we're not going to tolerate you Asian Christians celebrating Christ, our Passover, on the Passover. We want a uniform celebration done on a Sunday, and we will tell you exactly how to celebrate it. This Pope Victor 
began excommunicating the Christians of Asia Minor because they were celebrating Easter at this time. Now, I'm just saying, if I were one of these people in that day, and my convictions were such that I'm, I know that Christ is the fulfillment of the Passover, and I'm, I'm convinced that's the day I should be celebrating, let me celebrate my thing. You celebrate yours. Leave me alone. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm going to be perfectly happy. If you, just, you just go and do whatever you want. You can wear a, a fish hat if you want or whatever you want to do, but I'm going to have my celebration. But he started excommunicating Christians. That began an incredible schism. And we know for a fact the target of some of these people who were being threatened by excommunication were at the churches specifically at Ephesus. This is no accident, by the way, when you consider that both John and Paul had been there at Ephesus and had ingrained enough teaching there. Oh, I'm sure that as time goes by, there are certain things that morph a little bit. But the necessity of the demand of the church was such there is a record in the Church Fathers that tells about the aged Polycarp going to uh, see, I believe it is the Pope, uh, I think it's the Pope before Victor, could be something like that. There's a strange uh, connection with one person who was Pope for a short period of time. I'm not sure if that's the Pope, but he goes to see him, and they basically, in this letter, which is chronicled in the Church Fathers, they agree to disagree. And they kind of left it at that. It's chronicled in a, in a letter that all can read. But the problem I'm trying to show here is that the church, the Roman church, was determined to make it, this is, this is how we're declaring it. Nothing else will be tolerated. This is dogma. That's that. So if you weren't following that, you're out. This is the thing, I guess, I can understand people saying, I just can't trust. I just, I'm not sure. I go back to things I mentioned, like the reliability of this book. Let me ask you a question. Why is it that we'll read secular history chronicling the life of Alexander the Great, who died in 323 BC, written by a first or second century writer, Plutarch? Why would we, and we trust that, we believe implicitly, but we have trouble reading this book and saying, this is true. And the same thing is true with church history. Many people who are steeped in that church will not listen to the history and say, that's impossible, that church would not do that. And yet they did. And you've got a successive wave of these, we'll call them um, demands. The same thing happened with Christmas and many other holidays where it just seems like, well, you know, it, this, is, this is how it is. And, and it doesn't matter that we could study this book and we could look for all the evidence and all the proof and say, well, Christmas is, is not in the book. And yet you'll, you'll see at Christmas time, put Christ back into Christmas. He was never there. <laughs> and Easter, by the way, is kind of a fascinating, uh, I had to write this down for myself. It's kind of fascinating because Easter is English stemming from uh, the North Umbrian Istre, from the Proto-Germanic Austron, which is dawn, also the name Easter stemming from Ishtar, the fertility goddess, also another known goddess, if you will. I mean, there's all these different spawning out of, but that's all from Easter. And if you look to the beginning of the book here, the Passover, that was instituted in Exodus in the Hebrew, which is uh, our word Pesa, Pasa, Pesa, Hebrew word. And by the way, that word Passover was brought into the English language by Tyndale, the Bible translator, as well as, hate to tell you, Easter was as well. So go figure that one out. But and my point is if you follow the stream of language, Pas Pesa, Passover, that also is in the Greek, Pascha, Pascha, Passover, Pasco to suffer. 
But these are the Greek words. You can definitely see right there when we talk and use the word, the English word Easter, we're talking about something that didn't, it wasn't even part of this whole, what is being told, the passing over of the death angel, the covering of the applying of the blood to pass out essentially the act of faith of trusting in God's word to the application of the blood for the children of Israel to be delivered out of Egypt's bondage and for us to be trusting in Christ's spilt blood, his shed blood, as the atonement sufficient to pay for all of my sins and yours, past, present, and future, and to guarantee my eternal position with him. As long as I keep trusting him, I keep faithing in him, that's all he asks. So the word Passover should have been carried all the way through, even to our current celebration. I'm not suggesting that we tell everybody, stop calling it Easter. But I'm suggesting for those people who say, but I, I, I can't trust the church. You have good reason to not trust the church. I remember the first time I heard Dr. Scott, and I'm just, I lay it out there. The first time I heard him talk about uh, Tammuz and Samiramus, and I was sitting listening, I was thinking, wow, this is a freak show. <laughs> what? I'm sorry, I'm just going to let it all hang out. I was sitting thinking, what? What is he saying? <laughs> oh. Then, you know, she gave birth, and, you know, and then it's just, just and, and I, I'm listening to all this. I mean, if you, if you're listening to this message and you say, who is Samiramis and who is Tom? Who is all, I may get to that later, but it's way out there, okay? But in fact, you've got to look into antiquity to see that many of the creation myths and the creation themes are perversions and corruptions of this book. That is not to be you know, omitted. So why am I presenting all this today like this? There's a reason because I want to start peeling apart and looking at why. If somebody is, is, as I said, for me, it's two individuals I have in mind. It may be more, but certainly these two I have in mind. I'd like to say you have good reason to not trust. But there's a big difference between not trusting the institution versus trusting God. And these two the lines can get very blurred if you're not careful. Why? Because you come into one brand of Christianity or one branch of the church that says, just trust me. You don't have to do anything else. Just follow me. You don't even need a book. You don't need to know anything. You just follow me. And, and when it's time for you to do whatever, I'll tell you what to do. Versus somebody like me who says, here, I want to give you all the information. And I know it's a lot to ask somebody, but I'm asking you to consider the information. I'm asking you to consider history. I'm asking you to consider some language. I'm asking you to consider the fact that we human beings are fallible. We all, all of us, make mistakes, have misunderstandings, have biases to certain things where we become dogmatic and we insist that our way is the only way. There is one way here, and as I said, it's still a problem because we're dealing with the English language, which falls radically short of the original precision of Greek. But at least when I say, give me the opportunity, and if not me, find someone who, will give, who, who you will listen to who is not saying, just follow me blindly. I'm asking you to engage in, a, in an activity called higher learning in the things of God, which doesn't require you to uh, don a certain particular vestiture or a certain position or become less or change who you are. If there's something to be changed about you, believe me, God will do it, and it will be imperceptible, and it will be over time. Now, some people worry about, especially I've encountered men, who worry tremendously that if they start following, that they will somehow become these pushovers, and they'll become like milk toast people. And it's like, I don't, listen, I don't know what type of Jesus you're familiar with. The, the one I know is the Jesus that when it was the right time, he could turn over the tables of the money changers and have that scourge ready to chase him out when it was needed. And when it was needed for him to use a certain type of speech with his disciples or others, he did that. It wasn't always, you know, Jesus is a macho man. You know, he's, he's the coolest guy around. You, what's happening, right? <laughs> Sorry, if that's the Jesus you're looking for, he ain't never going to get saved, okay? There, there may be another boat coming your way, but it probably will not take you anywhere, okay? <laughs> 
let's just settle that one. But all of this begins somewhere. You've got to start somewhere. As I said, I just peeled apart some history and said to you, well, what does it matter? The Roman Catholic Church said celebrate it on Sunday, and the Asia Minor Church said we want to celebrate it on the Passover. Well, it matters this way. Suddenly, if you look back far enough, you're going to find an institution of another holiday which we do not celebrate, Lent. And if you look far enough, you'll find that is in antiquity, in literature that is belonging to the Babylonian type of, of we'll call it caricature. And even worse than this, when it made its way in, oh, you're going to love this one. This is very reminiscent of Dr. Scott's white raisins. <laughs> when this particular passage <clears throat> was being translated by one of the translators in antiquity, he didn't say 40 days of fasting. What happened, it was actually a typo. And you can go check this out. I'm not making this up. You know, they, when they copied, they copied. It wasn't like our today. If you make a mistake, you white it out, tear up the piece of paper. They're using uh, fine materials where you can, if you make a mistake, <laughs> and sometimes you can make a mistake, you don't even know you made one. Um, what should have read 40 hours was translated into the church canon as 40 days. Ask how it got canonized to be celebrated that way. And people say, I'm giving up something for 40 days for Lent. And I have many of my friends do. And I, I had to ask one of them, why? <laughs> I mean, give it up because you want to give it up. But don't give it up because somebody told you that that's what you're supposed to do. Because that, that is not part of the equation. And you know, you could say, well, because Jesus went you know, and 40 days represents a total time of testing. Let me ask you a question. Now, one of, one of my Catholic friends said they, they gave up something that they, they just can't live without for 40 days. Chocolate. <laughs> oh, it's a sacrifice, Lord. I'm sacrificing this chocolate for you. I want you to know that. Is that crazy enough? I'm, listen, I'm not making fun of Catholics. I love my Catholic friends. I'm asking people to take a look, to really look at things. It's, it is as easy to do and as confusing at times as when you read in the newspaper and they say, drink coffee, it's good for you. And then six months later, they say, don't drink coffee, it's bad for you, right? It's as confusing as that at times. But if you keep looking, Christ said, the truth will set you free. And it is not you know, we, as I said, you can get hung up on the minutia, we'll call them the things that are at the outside border of Christianity, which most people get hung up on, or you can aim for the center. I want to know that Christ came out of that tomb. I want to know that the disciples actually saw what they saw, recorded to the best of their ability what they saw if they were eyewitnesses. And if they weren't, I want to know why I should listen to someone who wasn't an eyewitness that then can solidify he did come out of the tomb, setting all the proofs up. He did come out of the tomb. And if he did come out of the tomb, Paul tells me, Christ is the first goer. He is the first fruit of this particular way. They were called the way in the early church, this particular way of passing. Basically, Revelation says that he has the keys of death, possessing them. That means that death has no more dominion over us. We just don't die and stay in the ground, but we are to be with him. If all of this, if Christ is not risen, our faith is in vain. It means you, you and I are wasting our time. But if he is risen, if I can look at the proof, if I can look back at history and say, now, I just took you through a couple hundred years of church history in, in the most generic uh, softest way I could because I could get into a lot of minutia. I love detail. I have to steer clear of, the, of all that stuff because I could drive people crazy, right? But I just took you through some church history to show you how we should look and we should analyze and we should ask questions. God's not going to be offended if we ask a question to know what is this we're doing. And if it's not in the book, if we can't find it in the book, then we should be asking ourselves the question, why are we doing this thing? And we're talking about things that matter 
to the saving of our soul, things that matter concerning our faith. And as for the people that we love who don't have the faith yet, my prayer is this, and I'm asking first God to help me that next week I might present a clear, better picture for those same two people, and maybe we'll add a few, who actually need the foundation and some of the reasons why. As I showed you, I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer that if you keep looking, if you keep searching, you'll get to the bottom. There's always some, some kernel of truth somewhere you'll get to the bottom of, and there'll be a moment where you say, that's how that came to be. I taught one time on festival about why, again, I seem to be picking on Catholics, I'm not, but why the Catholics love the bees and the rosary. Just go historically look that up and you'll see where that came from. But did, did Mary, the mother of Jesus, have beads? Rosary beads? I mean, the guy who designed that stained glass happened to think so. And the stained glass in the chapel. His first rendition, she was wearing blue and she had the beads. And they all had sunbursts. And I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's not happening. I'll talk about all these things, but I'm, I'm asking those really who I'm intending to deliver this message to today, which has just been kind of an introduction to finding out what we don't know and uncovering why we should ask those questions that appear to be, you know, when somebody says, well, I don't trust the church. You should trust God, though. Not trusting the church is one thing. Trusting God is another. And where I say those lines get a little blurry, yes, God gave some domata, some gift teachers to the church for a purpose for bringing us to the faith, to, to the perfecting of our faith, so that we all might come to understand and know who Christ is, the perfect man. Beyond that, you're going to find that anyone who is on this side of the pulpit, man or woman or question mark, whatever they are, <laughs> if their focus is not to bring men and women to that knowledge, to bring greater faith, there is no other reason for the church to exist. It is for us to basically thrive in a world that is full of valleys. And while we are in this valley, we become blessed people because we get to know that the God we serve intends much more for us than just what we have right now. And that's not a promise of, of blessings that are going to be overflowing like some profess like this, but the blessing of being with him. That the terminus of our life here is not the end of everything. This is this begins. This is the boot camp. This is the beginning of understanding where you will be and who you will be with for eternity. Don't you want to know about that? Yes, then be here next week. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.